and we uh, got it. Yeah. So um, that that explains the timing of, of the uh, seminar. It's it's uh, late afternoon in Denmark and early morning in the United States, uh, and uh, we plan to have a seminar once a month. And we have already uh, a few slots filled up. But if you're interested in, in uh, joining the seminar series or contributing to the seminar series, then please contact me or uh, Sue Ellen Haupt and we'll uh, find a slot for you. So without further ado, I'll give the word to Sue, who will introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Julie Lundquist. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Jakob. Um, Professor Julie Young Lundquist leads an interdisciplinary research group at the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences at the University of Colorado Boulder. She has a joint appointment with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And her research group uses observational and computational approaches to understand the atmospheric boundary layer with an emphasis on atmospheric influences on turbine productivity, turbine weight dynamics, and downwind impacts of wind energy. Her PhD is in astrophysical planetary and atmospheric sciences, also from CU, where she also earned her master's. She's a fellow of the American Meteorological Society, and today she's talking about wind conditions in category one to three tropical cyclones uh, that can exceed wind turbine design standards. Julie, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks very much, Sue, uh, for that kind introduction. And, and thank you to you, um, to you, Jakob, for the, the invitation to speak here today. So I, I want to wish a good afternoon to everybody in Europe and in Africa who is able to, to join in. And then, of course, good morning to those of us in North America and South America. And if we have anyone joining from uh, from Asia or Australia, then thank you very much for staying up late at night uh, to join. So it's really exciting to help kick off this uh, collaborative uh, wind energy seminar series. I've learned a lot from my colleagues in Denmark and in Europe, and I'm really looking forward to, to stronger collaborations. So I have the pleasure today of speaking about uh, some work that was led by uh, my PhD student, Miguel Sanchez Gomez, who has since graduated and has moved on to NREL as, in a postdoctoral position. So we carried out this work in the context of a project called OWIND, which was funded by the National Offshore Wind Research and Development Consortium, where we're really thinking about hurricane risk to offshore wind turbines. And so as the atmospheric scientists in the group, we were really focused on the winds and the met ocean conditions. But we benefited a lot from our collaborations with Yorgos Deskos at NREL and Sanjay Arwade at the University of Massachusetts and Andy Myers and Jerry Hajar at Northeastern University and in terms of placing the larger context of the work that we're, we're doing here. So again, we're interested in tropical cyclones and hurricanes. So I always love showing this beautiful picture, which is you know very exciting to see what we can understand about our world from satellites. But it's also important to remember the devastation that these types of storms can bring. So this image is actually from 2017, and it was a situation where we had three different or two hurricanes and one tropical storm seen in one view. So we have Hurricane Katya here, um, Hurricane Irma, and then Tropical Storm Jose. And uh, what's kind of interesting about this particular year is that a few weeks later, um, Hurricane Maria would bring a lot of devastation and cause a humanitarian crisis on Puerto Rico. So it's important when we think about, you know, the complex and, and beautiful fluid dynamics of tropical storms, tropical cyclones, hurricanes, typhoons, it's important that we remember how uh, potent and powerful and dangerous they could be. Um, the other reason I like this uh, picture is, you know, there are three things here, and I will be talking about three different aspects of uh, the, the hurricane wind energy interaction um, issue. So first, I'm going to give an overview of tropical cyclones and why they're important to wind energy, because not everyone is a meteorologist in this group. And so I wanted to make sure that um, we all have uh, some appropriate language to talk about it. And then second, I will talk about the paper that I highlighted before about what large eddy simulations can tell us about hurricane winds and turbulence. 
And then finally, I want to talk about the larger context of hurricane risk. So this is highlighting some work that my colleagues at Clemson University um, are carrying out in the Owen project. All right, so first the overview. Uh, um, Sue, could you make sure that um, other people are muted, please? Thank you. Hey, doing Okay, so um, I wanted to highlight the areas that um, the U.S. Department of Energy and the Bureau of Offshore Energy Management have um, planned for offshore wind development in the United States. So we're highlighting three regions here. Of course, there's also a lot of development planned on the West Coast as well, but here we're highlighting the Atlantic Basin. So you can see in the region near Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey, there's a lot of different lease areas as well as some call areas that are planned for offshore wind development. As we move further south along the Atlantic coast, here we're looking at Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina. There are other offshore wind energy areas as well. And then of course in the Gulf of Mexico where they recently had um, an open bid. Then when we compare these maps to the maps of historical tropical cyclone tracks, and these are uh, collected by NOAA and uh, put together in this beautiful image, you can see, um, and here Miguel has put boxes over the regions that map onto what we see over here on the left. You can see that there is definitely a historical precedent for tropical cyclones to interact with these regions where wind farms are planned. And we can actually look at the historical record for the return periods in these regions as well. So the colored dots here are pretty interesting. They can tell us how, um, frequently we would expect to see a hurricane of category one through five intersecting each of these regions. So if you go to NOAA's website where they present this tropical cyclone climatology, you can actually break this down by individual category of hurricanes, but this is just the aggregate image overall. And you can see that in South Florida and in parts of Louisiana um, and parts of North Carolina, we have a very short return period where we expect to have at least one hurricane uh, every five to seven years. And then in northern regions, we expect to have a return period that is uh, longer, 17 to 24 years. And then the, the Gulf Coast has uh, quite a bit of variability as well. So if we think about the lifetime of a typical wind plant, we're thinking 20 to 25 years, maybe longer. It's important to remember that the return period of tropical cyclones can be shorter than the lifetime of the wind plants that we are expecting to build. So therefore, it's important for us to think about the possible effects of tropical cyclones on wind plants. So I mentioned Hurricane Maria before. Um, this is an image from, I believe, the Punta Lima wind farm, which is on the eastern end of the island of Puerto Rico. And when Maria hit Puerto Rico, it was um, at, uh, I think it was either category four or just under, maybe just category five, but it was in a very strong situation when it hit the island and caused a lot of devastation to this particular wind farm. There was another large wind farm that is kind of halfway through, um, halfway on an east-west axis, halfway through the island. And um, that wind farm was actually fine in Hurricane Maria. They were ready to be up and operating the next day and just waiting for the power grid. So it's really important to understand the details of what is happening in a particular tropical cyclone um, in order to predict what it will do to, to turbines. So, you know, this is the seminar series is thinking about collaboration and thinking about learning and thinking about exchanging information. So I wanted to draw your attention to this really nice review paper um, by Ishihara et al. in 2005 that summarizes uh, a lot of the damage that they've seen in Asia to coastal uh, wind farms during different uh, typhoons as well. So um, it's important to understand a tropical cyclone wind and turbulent characteristics in order to either make sure that these types of things don't happen or that we plan for them and are able to, to respond to them. Okay, so it's probably a good time to take a step back and think a little bit about the larger picture. So I want to make sure that we all have good um, terminology. So a tropical cyclone is the same thing as a hurricane and a typhoon. They're just named differently based on the regions of the world that they are forming and, and affecting. So these are very large clusters, organized clusters of thunderstorms. So the, the organized cluster has a warm core. It's a low pressure system and the circulation is very organized. 
they tend to form over warm ocean waters and the warmer the water, the more powerful the storm. And in the formation stage, they need relatively low values of wind shear between the surface and the upper troposphere. Now, this is different from the wind shear that we think about close to the surface that would affect wind turbines. But when we think about the troposphere, we need low values of wind shear when they're forming. We also need a lot of moisture available. And it's important to remember that these are huge storms. They can be thousands of kilometers wide and they can last uh, several days um, and weeks. So this image here is of Hurricane Lee. Um, this was taken yesterday. I didn't have time this morning to get an updated version of today, but this is showing that its hurricane force wind field is extending almost 150 mile, or 150 kilometers out from the eye of the storm. And then tropical storm force winds are extending 330 kilometers out from the storm. So these can affect a very, very wide region. And of course, the eye wall, I'll talk about the structure of the storm in a minute, but the most intense winds are clustered in, in one particular area, but there are very strong winds that extend, um, that extend throughout. Okay, um, so next, uh, I like to show this image when I teach an introductory weather class at CU Boulder, just to remind people that when we talk about typhoons and cyclones and hurricanes, these are all the same physical process. They're just named differently depending on what, what part of the world we're, we're talking about. Okay, so now if we're caring about winds and turbulence in tropical cyclones, we need to think about the structural elements of these storms. So these are some nice images uh, from the Comet program at NCAR. So we have kind of a broad picture view of a hurricane or of a tropical cyclone on top, and then we have kind of a zoomed in version of the eye wall. And so there are some important structural elements that we need to remember. First, we have a low pressure system, and so we have convergence in the boundary layer into that um, low pressure system. So we're going to always have inflow in the radial direction in addition to tangential flow circulating around the eye of the storm. So the eye is often clear, but not always clear. It's characterized by quiescent, not totally quiescent winds, but much lighter winds than what you would expect um, when you think about a hurricane. And that air tends to be sinking. And so that's why we often, but not always, have a cloud-free um, eye of the hurricane. So the eye wall is probably what's of greatest interest to people interested in extreme winds. And so this is the ring of the tallest and most powerful thunderstorms around that central eye. Um, Sue, could you take care of the background noise again? Um, so this is the, the region in the eye wall is where we have heavy rains and uh, the strongest winds. And so a lot of the, the large eddy simulation analysis that I'll show you in a little bit focuses on what's happening in that eye wall. So when we look at hurricanes from satellite, we'll often see this cirrus cloud shield up on top that forms when we have outflow um, coming up out of those, those thunderstorms and outflow out and around um, the hurricane. Um, we also have rain bands, which are interesting because these are also thunderstorms that are organized and rotating around that central eye. And so we have strong wind, we have strong rain in these rain bands. And so if you are on the ground or on a boat, hopefully not, experiencing the passage of a tropical cyclone, then you will experience kind of periods of intense rain and winds, less intense rain and winds, more intense repeatedly until you get to the eye and then um, and then the, the pattern will repeat again. Okay, so I just wanna emphasize that the eye wall is where we have the maximum wind speeds in a tropical cyclone. And so I'll often be talking about the radius of maximum winds. And that's basically thinking about from the center of the eye out to the eye wall. All right, um, and I couldn't decide <laughs> which of those images I liked the best. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to see this same concept, just a slightly different picture. Um, and I like how this really emphasizes the, the um, convergence into, into the eye here, but it's the same idea. So if you are interested in what we actually know about tropical cyclones and, and how we got to understand that, I, I lost several hours, or not lost, but I used several hours wisely this weekend uh, reviewing uh, Carrie Emanuel's really nice review paper um, that summarizes 100 years of progress in tropical cyclone research. 
um, that he published about five years ago. And so it's fascinating to see how much we as an atmospheric science community learned about these storms with very little information um, in the, the 60s and 70s and 80s. And then comparing that to the, the wealth of data that we have now. And of course, we still need more data. Um, but if you want re further reading, I highly recommend uh, this paper. All right, so we've got the We've covered the winds. We've got air spiraling in towards the center. We've got air spiraling out in the opposite direction. Okay, I think the last piece of information that we need is to make sure everybody understands what I'm talking about when I talk about a category one or category five storm. And so the Saffir Simpson hurricane scale is what is often used, at least in North America, to categorize uh, the strength of different storms. So, um, the strongest and most intense um, hurricane is a category five hurricane. And so these are devastating. These are catastrophic. Buildings will be destroyed. All trees will be destroyed. Shrubs will be downed and, and things like that. So the, these are these are bad news. And um, but I also don't want to minimize the fact that even a category one hurricane at the other end of the spectrum can cause damage. And so power lines will be blown down. Tree branches will come down and some structures will experience a lot of damage. But if you wanna think about the thresholds of winds in terms of miles per hour or in terms of kilometers per hour, these are the thresholds. And those thresholds are based on winds measured at 10 meters above the surface. So this is not always useful in the wind energy world because we're used to thinking about hub height winds because that's what's affecting our structures. But it's important to remember that a lot of the work looking at tropical cyclones is focused on 10 meters above the surface. And then we need to do a lot of extrapolation to move it on up to the altitudes that we care about. Um, again, the scale is also based on uh, one minute um, average maximum wind speeds. All right, oh yeah, one more thing I wanted to talk about. Um, the size can vary quite a bit for tropical cyclones. Um, so this map of the continental United States has superimposed on top of it two different uh, tropical storms. One, uh, an Asian super typhoon tip, which has a huge radius, covers half of uh, you know part of North America. And then the tropical storm Marco okay. is much, much smaller and um, is shown here for contrast. But I want you to remember that the size of a storm does not necessarily indicate its intensity. So you can have very powerful uh, winds in a very small radius storm. And so this is important because we're going to talk about scaling results from large eddy simulations to different sizes of storms. Um, but you know, NOAA has some really nice uh, background information about tropical cyclones here on their primer, and they have a nice reminder that we can have hurricane force winds 240 kilometers out from a large tropical cyclone and tropical storm force winds almost 500 kilometers out. So it's it's important to remember that um, a large area, you know, multiple wind resource areas could be covered uh, by one storm if it hits in the right location or the wrong location as the case may be. Okay, also thinking about uh, the winds that um, are experienced in a storm. There are two different types of winds that we need to think about. There's the winds within the storm itself. And so this is an example from a, a really nice textbook where within the storm, the, the winds are spinning around at, in this case, 175 kilometers per hour. But it's important to remember that the storm is also translating as well. And so in this case, the, the hurricane movement was 50 kilometers per hour. And so on the forward right quadrant, in north in the northern hemisphere, you'll end up with faster winds because you have a net um, combination of the storm's winds and then the the translation winds. Similarly, in the back left quadrant, uh, the winds will be uh, slower as as well. So when we think about the winds in a hurricane, if it's moving or in a tropical cyclone, we also need to remember to think about how um, the motion of the storm will affect that as well. And now I wanna get into some satellite observations of uh, tropical storms to think about how we can summarize the winds in a system. So this is again, another really nice paper that I would recommend if you want to get um, a, kind of a broader picture of tropical cyclone wind fields. So this was a summary of scatterometer observations. And I don't remember how many storms they had included in this. I'm pretty sure it was hundreds. 
Um, but this is one example from one particular storm where the satellite-based scatterometer measurements showed uh, the circulation at nominally 10 meters above the surface rotating around the eye. So you can see the convergence into the eye at the surface as well as the rotation around. And then it's a very common thing to do to take transects across the eye to try to understand the shape of the wind profile. So here we have a transect taken um, in the east-west direction right across this hurricane. And you can see that the you know, acceleration on the right side that I mentioned in the previous slide is shown here. So these two lines are slightly different. The red line is based on the data summarized here on the left. The blue is a vortex model, essentially, that's, that was used to predict this particular storm. So those details are not important. I just want you to see that we have the feature of the eye wall, the radius of maximum winds, we have the quiescent or at least slower wind speed eye in the middle, and then we still have strong winds extending out on either side of the storm. But that asymmetry is available there. So um, extending out that scatterometer assessment, um, they, yeah, it was 800, 816 tropical cyclones that they were able to look at. And one of the interesting things that we learned from that study is that you can take a lot of different storms with a lot of different sizes. And if you um, normalize their wind profiles with respect to the radius of maximum winds, which is here located at X over RM, is equal to one, either minus one or plus one, these lines will collapse. And there's there's two images in this paper, and I'm showing you the one where they don't look like they collapse, because I thought it was pretty interesting to look at how the central pressure of the tropical cyclones varied and then how that affected the shape of the winds. But if we um, don't segregate with respect to central pressure, these lines do collapse on, onto one line. And again, these are they have millions of observations of surface wind speeds from the scatterometer, um, looking again at 800 uh, tropical cyclones. And that asymmetry that I mentioned that is mostly due to the translational speed of the storm um, is, is clearly evident there. So that's what we know about tropical cyclones with, uh, based on what we've learned from satellite-based measurements. So again, this is estimating winds at 10 meters above the surface, which is, again, not what we actually need for, if we're thinking about wind energy purposes. So another data set that could be used is data sets from dropsons. And so these are um, devices that are usually dropped by aircraft flying above hurricanes, Sometimes now they're dropping uh, drones or uncrewed aerial systems that can fly through the storms and collect data, sending it back um, to the to the parent plane um, before uh, those devices um, uh, basically crash land. But we've learned a lot from dropsons uh, from these profiles that have been taken into hurricanes and into tropical storms. So we get temperatures, humidities, and pressures, and then assuming that the GPS position of the drop sound is correct, then we can calculate the winds based on the fall path of the drop sound. And I really like this paper um, led by Daniel Stern and George Bryan and Aberson, where they um, carefully analyzed and reanalyzed the, the drop sound database to identify extreme updrafts and basically mesovortices within the eye wall of, of hurricanes. Um, and that motivated some of the work that we did looking at category five storms, excuse me, a few years ago. Again, if you're looking for a great paper about extreme winds in uh, hurricanes and tropical storms, tropical cyclones, this is a good paper to, to check out. Now, returning to that Dropson database, this is where the data start to get relevant for wind energy purposes. So what we're looking at here is a contour plot where we have on the x-axis distance from the eye. So this is the radius normalized by the radius of maximum winds. So it's unitless. So the radius of maximum winds is here at one. And then the y-axis is height above the surface. And the gray contour tells us what the total wind speed is in meters per second. So the really interesting line here is this black dashed line, which tells us at what altitude the maximum wind speed in all of these storms was located. And it's pretty close to the surface. So when we're at the radius of maximum winds, it's around 500 meters above the surface. The further out we get, the higher up it gets, but it's still you know, confined to the lowest 1500 meters or so um, above the surface. So this idea that, um, 
the maximum winds are at the inflow region close to the surface where winds are coming into the low pressure system. That's also been confirmed um, in, in modeling studies as well. Now we're here to think about wind energy. And so I put a, a little cartoon of a GE Halyard um, with a maximum height of 260 meters on top of this plot so that we could see that there is, are strong winds and a lot of wind shear in this region uh, below the, the maximum winds. But as you get further out from the radius of maximum winds, that shear and those wind speeds drop off as well. So it's really important to understand where your turbine is going to be located with respect to the radius of maximum winds. That is the worst case scenario here. All right, so now we have a problem. We want to know about winds at a turbine hub height and across the turbine rotor disc. So we need to know the gusts, we need to know the mean wind speeds, we need to know gust factors, we need to know veer. That's one of my pet topics is wind veer, change of wind direction with height. And the people who design turbines to survive tropical storms, tropical cyclones and hurricanes, typhoons, need to know, uh, they need to have long time series of winds at particular altitudes. And unfortunately that's not available from you know, the 10 meter towers that are deployed in coastal areas. You can't get that extended time series from a drop sond or from a drone flight or from hurricane hunter flights. We don't want people flying that close to the surface in storms like this. So um, if you like me have been looking for observations that are available, you might find these papers helpful. Um, these are the observations that I'm aware of. Um, most of these are either onshore or um, are very close to coastal regions of uh, multiple uh, typhoon and tropical storm intersections. So these papers are here, but the problem that we have is that that's not enough information. We can't get everything that we need from, you know, uncrewed aerial systems, from hurricane hunters, from short towers, or from drop sons. So the solution that we've taken in our research group is to use large eddy simulations to quantify the characteristics that can't be well observed right now. And so uh, that brings us to part two of, um, of this presentation, where we're thinking about how large eddy simulations inform our ideas about hurricanes. So um, in previous work, we had taken some large eddy simulations that uh, George Bryan had carried out with his model CM1 and put, uh, this is work that was led by uh, my PhD student, Rochelle Warsnop, when she was at CU. Now she's at NOAA doing amazing and wonderful things. So we have these large eddy simulations of a Cat 5 hurricane. We extract data from virtual towers, and then we extract wind field characteristics. Here we have the three second gust um, at different locations. Um, um, here I'm just showing you the three second gust uh, within the eye wall of this category five storm. And then we can take those characteristics and feed that into turbine load estimators. So this is a paper um, led by the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where we took the, the data from the large eddy simulations and fed that into a load simulator to quantify different types of loads on structures in these category five storms. So that's essentially the same approach that we're taking here with the Owen project, but instead of focusing on category five storms, we're focusing on um, category one, two, and three storms so that um, we understand storms that are more likely to influence um, the northern Atlantic coast. So again, this is work that was led um, by Miguel Sanchez Gomez, a PhD student in my group who's now a postdoc doing wonderful things at NREL. So the idea was that we would simulate tropical cyclones of um, a range of intensity and size and then closely compare those wind statistics to what is ensconced in the IEC standard for wind turbine design specifications. So um, I can see that there are a lot of people here who are interested in modeling. And so most of the details of the modeling setup are described in the actual paper that came out earlier this year in JGR Atmospheres. But we did use a nested mesoscale LES setup in WARF. And uh, the characteristics of the mesoscale domains are here. The LES domains broken down by each of our storms, each row is a different storm, and we have domain four and domain five both carried out with large eddy simulations of these dimensions. Um, and I will point out that these are incredibly expensive simulations. These um, radius of maximum winds are relatively small compared to real storms. But if they were much bigger, it would have been a much larger computational lift. And so the, re the fact that we can 
scale wind characteristics with a radius of maximum winds becomes very important here because um, of the, the tremendous computational expense of these simulations. All right. Um, so the method that we used to trigger and then carry out these tropical cyclone simulations was based on an idea from uh, Professor Wren and Jimmy Dudia at um, NCAR. And so the idea is to have an initial vortex in the wharf simulation. And then by varying the surface temperature, basically the amount of energy that is available to the storm, then we can control the intensity of the storm. So again, here are, here are our domains, the mesoscale domains out here. And then we think it's incredibly important to have Largetti simulations so that we can capture the turbulent characteristics of what we have here. And our finest domain is domain five at 55 meter resolution. Okay, so the five storms are pictured here. The top two um, with surface temperatures of 26 and 28 Celsius are the ones that turn into category one storms. Then we have two category two storms and then our really hot surface gives us a category three storm. And then if we want to think about uh, the winds as they extend out from the eye, so the x-axis here is the radius of maximum winds, the, the radius normalized by the radius of maximum winds. So R hat is divided by, is just distance divided by the radius of maximum winds. And so this is the shape of, of those profiles for each of these individual storms. And they all have different um, radii of maximum winds. But essentially uh, the radius tends to increase as we increase the surface temperature. So the radius increases and the maximum wind speeds increase as well. All right, so those of you who have experimented with um, mesoscale LES nesting know that it's often a challenge to spin up turbulence in the smallest domain. And thankfully, with hurricanes, we have very fast winds and very large wind shear, and so spin up was very fast. So, um, let's see, I don't want to show that quite yet. So this is the, the spectrum at domain four at several different times in our simulations. And you can see that the initial spectrum doesn't have an adequate amount of turbulence. This dark line was taken at um, basically at initialization, but then by an hour into the simulation, we basically had reached a steady state with the power spectrum. So that's what we see here over here on the left. And then here we just have a time series of um, the maximum instantaneous wind speed in the domain. I don't remember if this was at 10 meters or at hub height, but this is for each of our storms. And you can see that initially, you know, we have these flat lines that indicate that we don't have turbulence spun up, but generally things spin up very quickly after that. And so these colored lines show the time period that we took for analysis, the hours starting at hour four for most of the storms, and then 50 minutes starting at hour two for the category three storm. And then here's a spectral development for domain five, which is very similar to domain four. Again, we're basically spun up um, by essentially 10 minutes into the simulation. All right, and then if to understand the radius of maximum winds, we are looking at the time average velocity field at 10 meters above the surface. So that's what is usually defined in um, the tropical cyclone modeling world. We follow that pattern here. So again, we have um, these uh, radii listed here. All right, so I wanted to show you the time series of our winds. So again, we have two cat one, two cat two, and one cat three storm. So here's the time series where the mean wind speed for the, the one minute average at 10 meters above the surface is listed here with a judgment of which category it is. So again, we have two cat ones, two cat twos. And notice that you know these are storms. They have a lot of variability. There's a lot of turbulence. And so sometimes they intersect other categories but on average, we're looking at, at their mean thresholds in order to define which category they're in. And then our last storm, the category three, is mostly in category three with some excursions into category two, but its mean wind speed does pass that threshold to be considered a category three storm. Okay, now the data. So this is where it gets fun. Um, so here is just an instantaneous snapshot of the 10 meter winds of one of our storms. And these dots are really important. So the red dots tell us locations where we are extracting towers. So we're extracting the wind, three components of the winds, the potential temperature and the pressure data. And we're recording that data at those red dots at every time step. 
So this is a lot of data, 18 data points a second uh, for the domain five. And we're focusing on the lowest 230 meters because of the type of turbine that we were imagining that we would put into the domain. And we focus our data extraction only on um, the regions around the radius of maximum winds. So 80% um, to 120% of that distance of the radius of maximum winds. So those are the red dots. Those are individual towers. The white dots represent locations where we extracted data at a cluster of the nine grid cells around that point. And so this is so that we can do some spectral analysis uh, later on, which we have not finished yet, but that data is available. And I should point out that all of the data from these simulations is publicly available already. And if you look at uh, the Sanchez Gomez et al. JGR paper in the data availability section, there's instructions about how to access those data. But you know, we collected these data, made these simulations with public funding, and so it's important that everyone have access to those data. So everything that I'm going to talk about here on out from the Largetti simulations is based on data extracted from these points, either these white points or these red points, in terms of classifying the extreme winds, the average winds, the gusts, and, and so on. Okay, but before we get to the data, we need to think about the larger context. So this is the IEC guidance for wind turbine design. So um, many of you may have looked at this form before, but if you have not, you know the top row defines the turbine class one, two, three, or class S. And then there are <clears throat> average winds that you expect for each class. And there are uh, reference extreme winds for each class. And then there's a tropical reference of 57 meters per second. Um, the class S turbine has values to be specified by the designer. And then there are also turbulence intensity um, classifications of 18% to 12% that apply to each of these classes. Okay, so class 1A are the turbines that we expect to be used in very high wind conditions, also with very uh, turbulent conditions where we're thinking about 18% turbulent intensity. And then the class 1A plus T is for regions that are prone to tropical cyclones. So that 57 meter per second threshold is important. So class one, class T. Now, if you're thinking about these wind speeds and going, wait a minute, this is past cutout on most turbines. Yes, that is true. So the cutout velocity, um, the, the cutout wind speed on most turbines is here at 25 meters per second. And it's important to remember that in a tropical storm, we would expect wind speeds both below and above cutout. But once we get into a tropical cyclone or hurricane situations, then we're thinking about a situation in which the turbine is parked and blades are feathered. So we're basically thinking about, can the turbine withstand the passage of these extreme winds? We're not thinking about generating power from hurricanes, unless you're very far away from the radius of maximum winds. All right, so again, we're thinking about parked conditions and for the design loads in those extreme events, we're thinking about a 50 year reoccurrence period where the winds um, on an average or a 10 minute period are defined by this equation here where we're thinking about height at you know whatever height we're thinking about in a reference height. We're thinking about a power law coefficient of 0 0.11. That's gonna become important later. And then we also think about the wind gusts that need to be survived, you know, with this 50 year reoccurrence period. And that's defined here as well. And then finally, there's a turbulence model or multiple turbulence models in the IEC standard, but the normal turbulence model is defined here. And again, we're thinking about the 10 minute standard deviation of the wind speeds. Um, and then if you want turbulence intensity, then you can go back and um, divide that by the, the mean wind speed. But this reference is defined here in the standard. So these are the numbers that we're going to be comparing our data extracted from the Largetti simulations to. And again, we're, we're thinking about the NREL 5 megawatt turbine. Uh, That's what we were focusing on when we started this project a few years ago with a hub height of 90 meters and a rotor diameter of 126 meters. And we're really thinking about those 50 and 57 meter per second reference wind speeds and the uh, reference turbulence intensity of 18%. Okay, so what we find out is that the hub height winds can exceed the design criteria for these turbines. 
So I'm going to show you a lot of images that all have a kind of a similar structure. Uh, let me just see if there's something um, in the chat. Okay, I don't need to worry about that. So a lot of these plots will have a similar structure. So we're going to be looking at histograms. So this is a percentage of occurrence. And this is the average 10 minute wind speed. And if we think about just our blue category one hurricane, so this is a tropical cyclone. This is the first and smallest one that we had simulated then the distribution of winds suggests that we're safe. We're not going to encounter that threshold. But as we get into bigger storms or stronger storms, then the distribution of winds start to exceed both that 50 meter per second threshold and the 57 meter per second threshold. And then category three um, has a lot of time um, out there as well. A lot of time past the 57 meter per second threshold. So if we think about that 50 year design criteria for either the class one or the class T turbine, then we're exceeding that criteria 85% or 28% of the time, depending on which criteria we're looking at. For these particular storms at a radius between 80% and 120% of the eye wall. That's a very important. This is just that ring around the eye wall. Okay, we can do the same study for the gusts where again, we can quantify the exceedances. The Cat 1 storms, we don't really have many exceedances to worry about. But um, if we think about the category two and three storms, we do exceed that gust exceedance, but only about 5% of the time. So that's probably not where we really need to, to be too concerned. Okay, and again, th these standards are, um, this design criteria is not something that we thought of. This is what is in the IAC standard, okay? So something that I have been interested in for a long time is wind shear and wind veer. And it's really important to note that what we find in these simulations show much larger shear than what is in the design specifications. So if we look at gusts first, so this is looking at the power law coefficient alpha calculated over a three second time period. So we're looking at the mean value over three seconds. If we look at that distribution, the probability density for all five of our storms, we can see that the, you know, the average is around 0.2, not 0.11, which is what is um, ensconced in the standard. Um, so 85% of the time we have wind gusts with shear that exceeds the design that exceeds the design specifications. If we look at the mean winds, um, as we would expect, the distribution becomes more narrow, but it's still centered around 0.2 rather than um, 0.11. And so we have um, a much larger power law exponent in these simulations than what is expected or designed for in the standards. And this is really important because if we have stronger wind shear, a larger value of alpha, that means that the winds at the top of the rotor layer, the winds at the top of the, the top tip of the blades, those are faster than expected. And so those can exert um, a larger um, a force at the top of the blades um, than, than could be expected. Okay, and then of course we all recognize that the IAC standards are not meant to apply to individual uh, crazy wind profiles, but because I'm an atmospheric scientist, I think it's important to point out that there are very complex wind profiles in these storms. And those um, complex profiles shown here um, Miguel did a nice job of highlighting the rotor disk of the NREL 5 megawatt turbine that we were using for this here. You can see that there are profiles that, you know, in some cases are nice and smooth and steady. Those are the IEC standards. But if you look at the individual profiles extracted from our simulations, there are very complex profiles that aren't accounted for, like, you know, with a lot of strong shear in one region, no shear in another region, and, and so on. So it's important to think about what that means for the structure. Okay, um, and now we want to think about the turbulence variability. And so um, the turbulence standards may also be underestimated as well. So again, this is the IEC reference and the class one and class T um, values that we would expect. So these values are marked here on um, the X axis to show um, what is expected in the standard. And then the colors show us um, at different radii for one storm what kind of distribution we have of, of turbulence. So the lightest colors are closest to the eye, the darkest and boldest colors are furthest away, and then the kind of middle color tells us the radius of maximum winds. So again, we have a lot of time 
maybe not the most, but we have some time where we are exceeding those turbulence models. So that was for category one. The stronger category one is here, category two shown here, and category three spends a lot of time exceeding that, um, that turbulence model in the standard. So our average um, values are well below what is expected, um, at least for the, the class T turbine, but the 95th percentile values are well above these limits. And so this is where we start to work with structural engineers um, like Sanjay and Andy in order to understand what this means for what needs to be accommodated in the designs of, of turbines. And again, we also have this data available should any turbine designers want to, to use the, this data in their systems as well. Okay, the good news that we have is that if we care about uh, wind direction changes at hub height, those wind direction Yamas alignment changes are very rarely exceeded. So if we define Yamas alignment as the maximum change in wind direction over a 10 second period, just calculated with simple differencing, um, then we can see our distributions of yaw misalignment on the x-axis, the probability density on the y-axis for each of our storms, two cat ones, two cat twos, and the cat three storm. Then we very rarely have um, exceedances of what, what is ensconced in the design standard. So um, we exceed eight degrees 17% of the time and 15 degrees, maybe 5% of the time, if that again, depending on the individual storm. So th this is good news. So we don't really need to worry about rapid changes of wind direction at hop height. Okay, and wind veer um, is very interesting to me. And I also find it fascinating that not only do we have strong wind veer in these storms, but it tends to not vary too much radially. So first let's make sure that everybody understands the idea of wind veer. So if the wind direction near the surface, in this case, is coming from, say, the northeast, then as we move further up in this extreme example, then the wind is actually coming from the east. So we have a 90 degree rotation basically from here to there. So there's a lot of interesting things about wind veer. Um, and Miguel's first uh, paper in my uh, research group was looking at how wind veer and wind shear affect turbine performance and onshore turbines. Um, and then we also discuss veer in the, the structural engineering paper led by UMass. Um, but if we're going to define veer for these particular hurricane cases as looking at the wind direction difference between the bottom and the top of the rotor disk, um, we are doing this because we recognize that veer can amplify loads and undermine performance of wind turbines. And but what we see <clears throat> for at least the regions that we were able to analyze between you know, 20% inside and 20% outside of the radius of maximum winds, the values of veer tend to be pretty constant. So for the category one storms, we're looking at between 0.05 and 0.1 um, degrees per meter. And I'll express this in terms of actual degrees across the rotor disk in a minute. But CAT2 numbers look pretty similar. These are the same Y ranges on all of these plots. So again, we don't have a lot of variability with distance and we don't have a lot of variability between the storms. So um, the median wind veer is listed here in terms of um, the number of degrees per meter. But if we want to think about that in terms of the, the degree change across the rotor disk, we're thinking about something between six and 11 degrees across the rotor disk of this NREL five megawatt turbine. So veer is there and it's strong and significant. Okay, so I wanna summarize the large eddy simulations here. And I think I should be sure to emphasize that although we are showing that the large eddy simulations show a lot of exceedances of the IEC standards, that does not necessarily imply that damage will occur. There are a lot of safety mechanisms built into turbines that are not addressed in our simulation. So we're not simulating damage. We are simulating the mid ocean conditions that lead to something that could lead to loads and damage. So this is just the first step of, of a long stage of events. But mm -hmm. we do wanna emphasize that hub height winds do exceed those specifications. Vertical shear is larger than what's in the standards and the turbulence variability can also be um, underestimated in the design criteria. That does not mean that damage will occur. And the final question is, how often are these types of storms even going to affect these wind resource areas? 
And I don't have a lot of time to go into these details, but I really wanted to highlight this OWIND consortium where we're working on a large set of problems, including the larger context of hurricane risk. So we've got atmospheric scientists like Miguel and myself, um, a lot of engineers and a lot of industry and people advising us to look at what is the actual risk to, um, to wind resource areas. And particularly right now, we're focused on the US East Coast areas um, and that's primarily, whoops, okay, thought that I had a nice slide here talking about our funding, but we are getting funding from the states of Massachusetts and um, Maryland and New Jersey in order to answer these questions. So briefly, I want to talk about the Stochastic Hurricane Catalog that Wei Chang Peng at Clemson and his research group are looking at. So they've taken the HERDAT2 database of historical storms, so we've got yeah. um, that database, and then he has, or they have generated uh, 100,000 years of simulations and uh, resulting, you know, 1.6 million hurricane tracks within, based on the characteristics of that database. And I'm not going to go into those details, um, but their group is, is writing a paper now about this. But the hazard maps that they're producing are trying to show what the 50-year risk for um, the 10-minute wind speeds at hub height are assuming their stochastic catalog for 10 meter winds and then extrapolating up using this power law coefficient. And the nice thing here is that the threshold that we're worried about, that 57 meter per second threshold, is not present in this map. Now, if we use an alpha value of 0.2, which is what we saw in the radius of maximum winds, then these dots that are outlined in black those do pass that 57 meter per second threshold. So there's a lot of research that we need to do in terms of understanding the typical um, wind shear power law coefficients in hurricanes and tropical storms, tropical cyclones, in order to better understand the risk to some of the wind resource areas. So I just wanted to highlight that work. Um, perhaps they may come back and, and give a seminar here. Um, but you know we're just at the beginning of understanding how tropical storms, tropical cyclones, hurricanes will be affecting wind energy. So we need to extend this work to look at loads. We can refine these large eddy simulations to better incorporate wind wave interaction. All of these simulations we're using a Tarnock relation for um, understanding surface roughness and how it increases with wind speed and then levels off. Uh, when we look at hazard maps, we need to think about how climate change will impact those hazard maps. And then the final question is, how are the insurance and reinsurance industries and the OEMs, excuse me, going to take this um, information into account? So um, I wanted to leave some time for questions here, so I'm happy to take them. And I will put up this uh, last slide of the conclusions uh, from the Sanchez Gomez et al. paper um, in order to hopefully trigger questions in that area. But thanks for your attention. Thanks so much, Julie. Uh, that was really wonderful. You can hear the virtual applause. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we do have one question in the chat already, and I uh, welcome people to raise their hand uh, and, and unmute uh, for uh, their own questions as well. Um, did you use CFD for simulations, and is this mostly about statistics and measurements? Okay, so um, in terms of CFD, we're using large eddy simulations, which is one type of computational fluid dynamics. So I, I'm not sure that I really understand that question. Um, in terms of measurements, I try to highlight that there are very few measurements available. So um, when we did the work with the category five storm five years ago with Rochelle Worsnop and George Bryan, we were able to take some aircraft data from Jun Zhang um, in Florida, where they were able to take power spectra and we were able to compare the power spectra from the simulations to the power spectra measured from the aircraft and found you know acceptable agreement there. But we are trying to um, work with the the Doppler on the, there's a mobile Doppler light Doppler radar system, um, the Doppler on wheels. and we're they have some wind data collected during several landfalls on the US East Coast. And so we're trying to, use those data for, for validation, if that was the, the direction of those questions. Mm -hmm. And Jakob has a question. Okay. Yes, maybe it's along the same lines, but uh, the finest resolution of your LES is 55 meters. So the effective resolution may be 
250 to 500 meters so it's even larger right. than rotor so I, I think aren't you underestimating the turbulence or? Yeah, there's certainly the possibility that we are underestimating the turbulence. So Miguel is actually doing a study right now where we are assessing how, um, as we refine the resolution, and we have some a few shorter simulations at finer resolution to try to understand the spectral variability and what resolution is actually required. So that's certainly a possibility, and we're investigating that to try to understand um, what resolution we have to have. Um, I think it's really important to use some large eddy simulations to do this. I don't think that mesoscale models will address this question appropriately, but um, it's to be determined if this was sufficient or not. And I'll just point out that the, the category five storms that we simulated a few years ago, those were at 30 meter resolution. And those are the ones that compared very well to the, um, to the aircraft data. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Dan Halk. Yeah, hi, thanks, Julie. Um, I had a question about the uh, shear results. Okay. Uh, so you you parameterized these by the the exponent there, um, but then when you showed the profiles, you made the point you said that you know they're not all power law. Um, right. They have just quite a variety of profiles. So I'm just wondering. I, I, don't, I don't know a better way to do that, but how might that change the results if it's not based on a power assumed power law profile? Yeah, there's always this debate about how do you aggregate together those types of data. And so, you know, I've, I have advocated in many different fora that the power law is not the best metric to use. But when we're trying to aggregate um, together so many different profiles and so many different conditions, you know, we could just take a simple wind speed difference between two layers. But, um, you know, I don't have a better solution right now than to just say, well, you know, the power law may slightly underestimate the shear that we're seeing, or if we use narrower delta Zs over which to calculate the, the power law coefficient, then we might get different answers. But I think that the overall take home message that, you know, the power law coefficient distribution for all the weaknesses of that definition, that's still a lot larger than what is in the standard. And so, um, you know, there could be effects on turbines that we would not be capturing because we're just using this difference between the bottom and the top of the rotor disc. But um, yeah, I would certainly be open to other suggestions of other ways to, to quantify shear. I was hoping you had the answer, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> More research is required. Yeah. Okay, NS Danke. Hi, Julie. Uh, thanks for the interesting presentation. Uh, Maybe I uh, missed it, but like, uh, what were the inputs to, to the WRF model? Like, uh, did you have to specify the surface roughness and potential temperature gradients or not? So um, for the surface roughness, that evolves throughout the simulation based on interactions between the wind speeds at the surface and the water. And so there, there's, a, um, there's a basically a bottom boundary condition that evolves within WARF. Um, and there, I think that there was an initial profile that's set up, but that erodes very, very quickly because you have this you know, initial profile, then you put a vortex in, and then that vortex becomes very quickly dominates the entire uh, domain of the simulation. So I think it's, I don't remember how many different cases Miguel tested, but it's very insensitive to that, that initial setup, as long as it's, um, as long as it provides enough moisture to work with. All right. That answers my question. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, uh, Verenda Gates um, in the chat noted that hurricanes also have heavy precipitation, um, and he's assuming you explicitly resolved cloud and rain properties. So could you comment on the potential for large raindrops to damage wind turbines and how often that could occur? Yeah, that's a, the, the issue of... Um blade erosion due to precipitation is pretty interesting. I don't follow that community very closely um, because I've heard varying things. So I'm not an expert in this by, by any doubt, but I know that people are interested in how large droplets and different kinds of droplets, whether these are liquid precipitation or ice in various forms. Um, one of the slides that I took out of this, it was actually a nice distribution of what kind of precipitation you have in different regions of the hurricane. Um, but some people are concerned about a blade erosion uh, due to large precipitation droplets. But other people, I have also heard, say that the OEMs are working on coatings that will prevent that problem. So I don't actually know. Um, so, Verenda, you probably know more than I do about um, 
how uh, turbines and blades can be protected from um, precipitation erosion effects. But um, yeah, that, that's definitely something to consider. And we were very focused on winds and turbulence. We weren't looking at the precip effects and we did not actually save any of the precip data at those virtual towers. We have the, the wharf out files for the full domains, but those are only saved every minute, I think. So we could go back and look at that if that would be interesting to you. Mm -hmm. Yen Zbang? I have to unmute myself. Sorry. Uh, yeah, this is Jens from Germany. Uh, thanks for the excellent presentation, Julie. Um, uh, what leads to this conclusion on this FOIL 53 that no uh, damage or no damage must be occurred, that it's not a consequence? I mean, if I look at, at the diagram, it looks like these storms exceed the design, the maximum wind speed uh, significantly, so they will be destroyed. So I am not a structural engineer, and the structural engineers that I collaborate with were very emphatic that just because the design standards are exceeded, that does not mean that damage will necessarily occur. So there's a lot of, of stuff that goes into turbine design that I don't want to speculate on, but I know that there are, um, you know, if we go back to the Puerto Rico example with, with Hurricane Maria, there were two different types of turbines at those two different wind farms. And so there's a question of, you know, the wind farm that was destroyed versus the wind farm that was not destroyed. Was that because of the robust design of one of the, one of the sets of turbines? Or was that because of the eroding strength of Maria as it moved across the island? So, you know, there's a lot of variability between different machines. And so I think that we wanted to be very clear that although the design standards will be exceeded or our simulation suggests that they will be exceeded, there's a lot of other stuff that happens down the road to determine whether or not damage will occur. So I know that that's a, a kind of a wishy-washy answer, Jens, but I... I feel like no, no. I mean, that's out of the area of where I'm an expert in, so I don't want to speculate too much on it. Yeah, yeah, so, and understand. Yeah, thank you, but thank okay, you very great. much. Hey, um, we're out of time, but we'll take a couple more if you're able to stay, Julie. Mm -hmm. Yep, I can stay um, for a From Rengen Consulting, will you simulate possible change of storms under climate change conditions? Yeah, that's a very hot topic right now. So um, I know that Wei Cheng Peng, um, my colleague at Clemson, they are actually currently working on um, looking at different um, sustainable pathways. So, you know, there are the, the prospects for how climate will warm based on different um, choices that society makes. And so they are looking at a couple of different um, of the future pathways to try to incorporate that, how that will affect sea surface temperatures and then how that will affect their, um, their hurricane risk catalog. So that is currently active research in their group. And I know that there are plenty of other groups who are also working on that. So um, if we you know, get funding for future stages of this project, then I will definitely be excited to take some of their inputs of different types of storms and do large eddy simulations of those as well. Mm -hmm. Miriam Gulbazi. Hey, Miriam. Um, hi. Uh, yeah, I can't turn on my video, I don't think. But um, so, Julie, I have a question about, first of all, thank you very much for the talk. It was really interesting. So I do mesoscale modeling for wind turbines. Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert in LES, but I was wondering when you do these modeling, do you couple it with an ocean model? And do you think if the wave field would change any of these results? Excellent. Yes. So that, that was one of the things that I tried to highlight, um, probably not thoroughly enough, on this slide here, where the way that we're doing these large eddy simulations right now, it has very minimal wind wave interaction. So this is, um, I have several proposals out right now on this topic, specifically to look at better coupling between the atmosphere and the ocean specifically to capture that wind wave interaction and to see how hub height winds and turbulence will change when we do uh, a tighter coupling. You know, there are so many parts of um, oceanographic and atmospheric science where we get pretty different results when we have um, different coupled systems. So I, I think that that is kind of the next stage of this work. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Jim Brasier notes that an issue with LES is the lower boundary conditions. And yep. he's asking, what does Wharf LES use for those lower boundary conditions at the ocean surface uh, for solution of momentum and potential temperature equations? And then notes, he could also ask about the upper boundary conditions. <laughs> okay, well, Jim, you're, you're in town, so we should meet and, and discuss this. Um, over lunch or something like that. But as I mentioned before, um, one of the more important lower boundary conditions is thinking about the surface roughness. And the way that Wharf LES does this right now is um, it's a modification of the Charnock relationship where the um, the roughness is a function of wind speed up to some threshold wind speed. I, think, I don't remember what it is. It's, I don't know, 25 or maybe 23, 30, I don't know somewhere in there where the the drag basically levels off at some wind speed but we do have um, heat and momentum going from the water into the atmosphere and that's how the the storms actually spin up and vary in their magnitude because we have to have that that surface heat flux coming in and you know at, at the most basic level we still have to use monomakov similarity theory to some extent um, in there that's really yeah, we, we can talk more. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, it's what I thought. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think um, we're five minutes past the hour, so I think we're going to have to end there. Um, but we really thank you for a wonderful start to our seminar series, Julie. What a great lead off. Um, next month will be on October 11th, and Raghu Krishnamurti of Pacific Northwest National Lab has agreed to talk to us about uh, some observational campaigns off the coast of the U.S. So look forward to seeing all of you back then. And, uh, you know, again, thanks, Julie, virtually for a great leadoff presentation. Yes. Oh, my Thank pleasure. And much, thanks Julie. again. For, thanks for the, the invitation. It was really fun. And I look forward to lots of emails from those of you with other questions. Yeah.